Karen England, and this is the Herbs Make the Difference podcast. I, uh, I live in Vista, California, and I'm joined today by my friend, Mary Drawley. And we met in 2010 at the San Diego Botanic Garden, and the Botanic Garden was called Quail Botanical Gardens at the time. It wasn't even San Diego Botanic Garden then. but And so it's really hard for me to remember to say what the new name is. I um, At that time, they no longer, to my knowledge, at that time they had a yearly herb festival, and Mary and I were... Uh, vendors and speakers and presenters and participants in that um, each year. And the one that we met was uh, 2010. We know that because I was representing the International Herb Association and the herb of the year that year was dill. And uh, (laughs) we met because of dill. (laughs) We're dill friends. She is a permaculturist and an armchair herbalist. She's a chef and a labyrinth builder extraordinaire. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate this. I um, We also went to school together, but we don't know each other from school. It just overlapped for one year in the 70s. She's younger than I am, and, uh, and we didn't meet then, but Still, we have the same alma mater. <laughs> go Mustangs. Yes, go Mustangs. They even changed our school name. I don't know what it is with Encinitas. Everything, all the names have changed of things. We're here today to talk about our love of the rose as an herb. And if you're surprised that roses are herbs, um, you're not the only one. It's, it's, um, I shock people all the time when I say one of my favorite herbs is a, the rose and people look at me cross-eyed. Rose was the herb of the year in 2012. And, uh, that was, I don't know about Mary, she's going to tell you herself, but for me, the, the rose was the highlight year so far of the 26 or 27 years of herbs of the year in the program. I actually nominated it, and so I take full credit that it, <laughs> even though it, I, 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 I had nothing really to do with it other than nominating it for herb of the year. Um, all right, tell us a little bit about yourself, Mary, and then let's get into the first uh business of roses as herbs. So I actually started gardening when I was a teenager in a Levenheim. Oh my gosh. That's a suburb for those of you who don't know of Encinitas. Yes, it is. And I actually rode my horse past the lima bean fields um, back then. That's why the Encinitas Heritage Museum has a lima bean festival every year, and nobody knows why. <laughs> well, actually, I, I helped write that cookbook, and I participated in every event we had, and I won every single year. <laughs> Oh. And it's great because I had that connection from horseback riding. Mm-hmm. When I went to school for chemistry, we actually had to extract the cyanide out of the lima bean. And so it's it's a wonderful little tie. And then I won all the, the um, wonderful recipes. <laughs> but we're here to talk about my absolute all-time favorite herb, and that's roses. I couldn't wait for 2012 to get here because I had planned that year to make a rose dish in every single class I taught. And even at the the herb fe- the the chocolate festival that um, Quail had, excuse me, San Diego Botanic <laughs> Gardens had, I actually made a chocolate um, rose salad. But we'll get into that later. Okay. Okay. We. Um, how long have you been in herbs? How long have you been an armchair herbalist? Oh, that's probably since I was a teenager as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. An armchair herbalist. I've been one. Well, I'm not an armchair herbalist. I'm an armchair herbologist, but that's a that's a whole nother story. Um, but I, since uh, 1989, a, a long, a very long time. Um, our questions are about something called plant guilds, which I believe is a permaculture 
term, and yes, you're going to explain it. And, but first, tell us what permaculture is, so, and then tell us what a plant guild is, and then we're going to talk about roses in plant guilds. So permaculture um, came about in the 1970s down in Australia. There were two men, Bill Mollison and Dave Holgram, who realized that our current agriculture practices are decimating the world. So they went out and studied a forest and looked at the way a forest maintains itself and how it sets itself up. It will have a center tree that is the most important tree in the forest. Underneath that tree will be shorter trees. Underneath those trees will be bushes. Underneath those bushes, oftentimes there are herbaceous plants, those that are like an annual plant that doesn't grow for more than a year. There's also vines that will climb up through the the um, trees and, and make their home on the trees and provide different foods for all of the animals in the forest. So they decided to take that idea and go back and look at agriculture and set up what's called a tree guild. And there are several, many, many trees you can do it with. There are some trees you can't do it with. Anything that is protecting the, the underside of the tree, not a good tree for plant guilds. That includes avocado and all citrus. But everything else that grows its branches up, perfect candidate. And roses are definitely fall into that category. Great. So we've talked about what a plant guild is, but we haven't talked about companion planting. Does Is that a separate thing from plant guilds or is it part of plant guilds? So a companion planting is actually um, plants that are annuals. They are not perennials. Plant guilds are based on anything that is a perennial and it can have some annuals in it. Companion planting usually involves what we've come to, to develop it as like two to three plants and it's mostly for pest protection. So that's what... Like we, a symbiotic yeah, relationship. That's what between, we focus on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When we do the plant, uh, the companion planting, okay. there is a way to do companion planting so that you can get the same benefits that you would get from a plant guild, and that is to secession plant. So let's say right now is a good time of the year to plant carrots. So once that carrots, those carrots are harvested, that's the perfect time to go in and start planting lettuce after the carrots. Once the lettuce is all gone, it's a good time for that soil to actually start planting peas. Those peas will actually put nitrogen back into your soil. Mm -hmm. Once the peas have been harvested, then the soil is ready for a more sophisticated plant like a strawberry that has flowers on it that you can get fruit from. Because that is takes... related to the rose. <laughs> and it's related to the rose. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. <laughs> So that's the difference between companion planting and per, and uh, a plant tree guild. Okay. So we've talked about what permaculture is. We've talked about what a plant guild is, what companion planting is. What different plants do you have in that guild and why? So the first one we always want to think about is the nitrogen fixer. Um all the soil, all plants need nitrogen. They actually need more than just nitrogen. They need um, several other minerals. And as long as you keep that pH of your soil neutral, all those minerals are able and ready, uh, available for the plants. So a good nitrogen fixer would be like red clover that grows all over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love clover. And a lot of people think of it as a weed, but it's actually a very beneficial plant. The next one you want to plant is called an accumulator. These plants have deep roots, and they draw up the nutrients deep from deep within the soil. When the plant decomposes, it makes those minerals more available for the shallow-rooted plants. Um, so that's a good plant to have in your garden. Another plant after that would be plants that repel bugs. Uh, many herbs, vegetables, and flowers have strong aromas that make them wonderful companion plants for the natural pest control, such as borage, yarrow, <clears throat> and my favorite, stinging nettle. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> okay, so I, sh I should probably say my favorite herb of all time is rose. My second favorite herb is lavender. And right after that, stinging nettle. I can I, hardly wait for it to come into my brother's yard. I, I can hardly wait either. It makes the most delicious soup. Of, and it's so nutritious that it, it's just like amazing. And you can't serve it to anybody when you tell them it's stinging nettle soup. <laughs> oh, I beg to differ. Okay. 
You serve it anyway. <laughs> I make, I can, when it's in the market at, at the Vista Farmers mm -hmm. Market and it's my weekend to cook, I go get as much stinging nettle as possible and I make an egg scramble because I can't do a frittata because all I have is my cooktop. Yeah. And I will tell, everybody will come by, oh my gosh, that's, that looks wonderful. What is it? I said, stinging nettle. And all I ask is one thank you bite. <laughs> and it's amazing how many people are hooked on it after that one thing. Yeah, right? okay. I, 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 that's fabulous. It, really quickly before we get back to roses, you have to know that the minute you cook a, a stinging nettle plant, let's say like uh, spinach or whatever, the stinging is all gone. In fact, if you harvest it about an hour later, the stinging is all gone. It's only when the plant is uh, on the... Uh, the leaves and everything is still on the root <laughs> that it is stinging. Yeah. Yeah, so. the minute that formic acid hits heat, it, it's, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And it's wonderful at sucking up a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So eat your stinging nettle. <laughs> yes, please do. Um, did you, are, Were you done? Did I stop you? So the next there you go go <laughs> keep going. So the next <laughs> plant we want to include in our guild is an attractor, and oftentimes those are also good mulchers. Attractors are um, ben beneficial plants that uh, feed insects on pollen, nectar, or plant juices to supplement their insect diet. In fact, the larvae of these insects that eat the majority of plants pests. It is our best. In it is in our best interest to provide a stable habitat, such as a perennial border. For the um, for our predatory friends to live in, so if you want, if you have an infestation of let's say white fly, you want to make sure that you know the bugs that can get to those white fly are there, or better yet, hummingbirds. Mm. <laughs> Try to keep your hummingbirds around because they'll actually eat all those white fly as well. So <clears throat> a mulcher is a plant that you would like. Let's say rhubarb. Rhubarb is a great mulcher because what you want to do, you don't want to eat the leaves because that's got too much oxalic acid in it. You just eat the stalk. So when you're out there harvesting that rhubarb, you cut the stalk and it's got that leaf on it. Cut the leaf on and just leave it because after all, you are supposed to leave the leaves. Yes, that's right. <laughs> they make great mulch. <clears throat> And that mulch actually helps to hold water in the ground. So you, you have less water putting into the ground as long as you've got that good thick mulch layer, which is why permaculture designers rely on three things, compost, compost tea, and mulch to keep the soil good and healthy and well insulated. So um, let's see. The other one is... Uh, repellers, which I think I may have already alluded to earlier, which are plants that repel bugs. So things that have a really super strong scent to them will often repel certain bugs. I was doing some research while I was putting my notes together for this and found out that scented geraniums and society garlic also help keep the squirrels away. So we're going to be using those at the Vista Academy for the Performing Arts, where I'm the permaculture designer responsible for a whole lot of gardens to see if we can keep those squirrels away. So that's pretty much all the plants that you'd want to have in your garden. Okay, so now specifically with roses, what would the plant guild with roses look like? Well, a good there's a lot of different plants you can put into that, but I'm going to pretty much stick to the ones that I appreciate the most. The first one I would probably put in my rose guild would be a lavender because lavender is a great attractor for different um, insects and beneficial insects mm -hmm. and beneficial birds. It's also a great repellent because it has such a strong smell to it. Oh, the other one I forgot to mention when I was going through the list are suppressors, and those are ground-hardy covers that improve the appearance of your yard and significantly reduce the time spent removing seeds that take the root where you don't want them. So lavender is a great suppressor also because it doesn't let a whole lot of things in the soil around it. And lavender is good for your system. It's good to make soaps. Lavender is an extremely versatile plant. My second favorite herb. Now, the other thing I like to have <laughs> in my guild with my roses is lemon balm. Lemon balm is an amazing plant because it actually helps calm and soothe, soothe your nervous system if you drink lemon balm tea or make a tincture out of it. Lemon balm is great because it is an attractor it is also a repellent plant. It is a suppressor plant, and it makes great mulch. So clover that I, I spoke about earlier, can't get enough clover. Clover is wonderful because it's an attractor, it's a suppressor, and it's a mulcher, and it's great at, at being a nitrogen fixer. 
and it's also an accumulator. The strawberries, which Karen mentioned earlier, are also a member of the rose family, also are great attractors, suppressors, nitrogen fixers, and accumulators. Now, another thing that I love to have in my garden around my roses is garlic. <laughs> garlic is great at, repel at repelling a great many things, so I like to have that. It's also a good suppressor and, an, and a good accumulator. Another um, herb I love to have around roses is fennel. It's a great attractor and repellent. Nasturtiums is another um, great uh, little flower that has a nice peppery, peppery flavor to it. When I was the garden teacher at the school in San Diego last year, I couldn't get enough nasturtiums to grow to keep the kids happy once they tasted them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so nasturti nasturtiums are just amazing. And the last thing that I've already alluded to is rhubarb because it's got wonderful mulching properties. That's a beautiful garden. If you look at it from a visual aspect, it's not your... A rose garden of old where there's rocks and 20 feet between a butcher to within an inch of its life stick man of a rose um, and just so ugly for such a beautiful plant that this kind of a garden where you have an a upper story of roses and a mid lower story and clover is a beautiful plant in, in the pink flowers or red flowers, depending on what variety you have, um, can be lush. Uh, lemon balm is green year-round, and it's got its, um, um, brings a, a nice, beautiful green color to it to the garden uh, rhubarb would be architectural I, I mean it's got it could have some real beauty in that guild just visually I um really quickly will tell you that I am one of the few people that doesn't like lemon bulb no worries <laughs> well I've gotten pushback from people who love it um I um I do use it mm -hmm. but I don't use it as tea it I grow a lot of it because it's beautiful it um I use it in um floral arranging with roses along with feverfew which I'm growing in my rose garden you didn't mention it but for me that it seems to be a, in my guild even though I didn't know that's what it was called <laughs> I now know what it's called I have a rose guild people um my Rose Guild has lemon balm and feverfew and calendula growing. Um, awesome. And I love the way it looks. And the, the lemon balm is still what I use when I start to get a, um, a fever blister or a, a cold sore because um, you just rub a leaf on your on the sore and it's it's a historic treatment and it works to this day yeah because it works on your nervous system yes. and that's what a fever a fever blister is it's yeah. is your nerves yes so um so i do use it but um i don't brew tea with it i use lemon verbena is what i the verb the lemony herb of choice for me um for tea and it it has different properties and acts differently um on the body than um, lemon balm does, but it's a delicious lemony herb with its own benefits, but it's not part of this guild. But anyway, I, I needed to admit that because um, people out there that are listening to this that have heard me talk will know that she didn't say she doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> people call me out on these things all the time because I'm pretty opinionated. Um... So before we wrap up our first session here on plant guilds, what um, if somebody's starting to garden in this way, can they start with like two roses and one rhubarb and a lemon balm and some clover and 
out of the gate have a mini plant guild? Yep, you sure can. You don't have to have a one for one. You can actually put it together so that maybe the roses are a little further apart and the guild is, uh, but you want to make sure that, that, that there's enough guild around the plants. Okay. So, but yeah, you can do that. Cause, okay. You know, the plants so aren't... somebody could go, uh, go out in a weekend and start their plant guild. Yes, they could. Provided oh. their soil is okay. Well, sure. Okay. <clears throat> but, but, but. Still, this is not hard no, in that it's sense. Not. It's companion planting in it in it in the best possible way, but it's uh, um, it's more permanent companion planting. Exactly. Whereas companion planting is more temporary because you're yes. only working with the annuals. annuals. That's right. This is permanent companion planting, and it's uh, the it's the long view to your garden. You're planting some roses. You're planting rhubarb is a long view plant i mean that's once you plant it you're going to have it for years and years and years so this isn't a short-term garden that you'll turn over and change with a season right so but with some planting uh, planning this uh, guild could happen really quickly it's not yeah oh i've got to you know it's going to be a few years before my guild is in place nope Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, you can go out and get now's the perfect time too. Yes. This is the time of the year when you'd want to plant roses and plant different Yes. This this is uh, I don't know where people will be listening from, but in Southern California, uh fall, which we're headed into if we're not already in it, is um second spring for us. And um and all that that would entail um planting wise and weather wise and everything um it's a it's a beautiful time for me i have better roses than uh, in the fall than i do in the spring and they're the same bushes because the second spring is the plants just respond so much better this has been so much fun and i know that we're going to do this again as soon as we're done here <laughs> Next, we're going to talk about how to how to use those in your in your food. Yeah, roses in your food. Yes. So, but we're going to sign off for this time. But I want to tell you that um, we're going to put all of Mary's information in the show notes of this podcast so that you can find her. But please, for everyone, just say how they can find you, like your website or your. Um, your contact information so that they can follow up about you and find you at the Vista Farmers Market, whatever it is that you um, can be found at, please tell the folks. So you can find me on Facebook. I have four different Facebook pages. Oh, well, great. I have Cooking with Clibs, and it's, K- it's C-O-O-K-I-N space W-I-T-H space K-L-I-B-S. Okay. I have the Dancing Raven Ranch and Retreat Center on Facebook. <laughs> They're getting longer. <laughs> that's my permaculture. That's actually the one that's okay. over everything else. And okay. I have, um, well, the wonderful Labyrinth Walkers, but we'll get into that in the, la- okay, in, the, okay. in the third time. And then I have my regular Mary Clibbs Drawly page. Okay. So you're going to find Mary Clibbs, K-L-I-B-S, Drawly, D-R-A-L-L-E, Mary's just regular Mary. Um, you're going to find her on Facebook on a number of on a number of ways, and you're going to find me at my blog edgehillherbfarm.blog. So until next time, for you it'll be in a week probably, and for us it's going to be in a couple minutes. <laughs> this is Karen England, and you've been listening to Herbs Make the Difference. Thank you, Karen.